please let me introduce to the stage the gentleman who will be delivering our welcome to country from the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council. Please give a very warm CDAT welcome to Mr. Brian Karen. <laughs> Can I have some of what you're having in your coffee bar? <laughs> and how much is it? <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name's Brendan. <laughs> there you go. It's funny. I was at the uh, I was at the AFL Giants game and, and did the welcome to country there. And I got there at eleven thirty. I wasn't on till two o'clock. And they asked me my name, and there had been a change of rep. They asked me my name, I wrote it down for it, spelled it, I got home and replayed. I watched myself on TV. <laughs> and underneath it said, Michael West. He's one of my colleagues. So I was just there at 11 o'clock, told you what my name was. So what a, how stupid did they look when I got up and introduced myself as Brendan? So I'm the cultural representative and cultural educator for Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council in Sydney. And for those of you that don't know about our Aboriginal Land Councils, under our Land Rights Act, we are the cultural authority and the guardians and custodians of land within our boundaries. In our perfect world, every organisation that works within our boundaries should have a relationship with the Land Council. Guardians and custodians of land are not traditional owners because no traditional owners left within the Sydney area. They've been wiped off the face of the earth. And that definition of traditional owner is you, you must have an ongoing continual connection to country. And unfortunately that was severed the day Cook landed. And I'm here to welcome you to country and with my welcome to countries, I share a very brief history of country because it's part of country. Um, and, and my history is your history. My backyard's your backyard. We all live here. Um, and, and some of that history, the, most of us can't forget. We live it every day. So in less than 50 years of Cook Landing, 80% of our people was wiped out within Sydney area. And the biggest killer was disease, uh, smallpox and the flu. And it didn't take long for the English to realise this, and so there were instances of them deliberately infecting clothing and blankets and handing that out to our communities as well as poisoning our water. So they were using chemical warfare. And the first to go were our elders. There went the wisdom and knowledge. The second to go were the young people. There went the future. And the second wave of the invasion brought what I call the land grab. And with the land grab came the massacres and the slaughters. And my story is no different than a lot of my countrymen's story. I had 500 of my family members, men, women and children slaughtered just over the water for their cattle to drink, men, women and children. I saw something interesting the other day, and I was talking about that fellow um, with the massacre down in Tasmania there, Australia's worst massacre. I, I don't think so. I don't think that's Australia's worst <laughs> massacre in history. Maybe for white people, not for our people. We then had a period on history and country of, of the kidnapped generation. I don't call it the stolen generation because we were kidnapped. My mother was taken at the age of five along with my aunties and uncles. They were locked up in a jail for two weeks. They were transported to training camps, Cootamundra Girls Home, Kinchula Boys Home, Bomaderry where the babies went, many other training camps. They were taught and trained how to be servants and slaves. They were sent out to white families to work and never got paid a cent for the work they did. Punished for speaking their own language and practicing their culture. And when I grew up uh, and, and this topic came up, the, most of the general feedback was get over it. What do you, get over it. We didn't do it, it had nothing to do with us. But unfortunately these laws were passed through parliament. No one ever stood up and said, no, that's not right. Stop it. 
So everyone was a part of that. Everyone. I was born in 1971 at Crown Street Women's Hospital at Surrey Hills. And that's the last place I ever felt my mother's touch in that hospital. It's the last time, 1971. Seven years ago, I found my mother's grave. I never met her. Found my mother's grave. I found I'm one of ten siblings that have been taken. And as I mentioned earlier, the second generation of family to be taken. Twelve months ago, I was lucky to find my father. Twelve months ago. I was also lucky that he was a bit of a, an alley cat at a young age because I was worried that he w I might have missed him or he's too old or so he's young enough for me to get to know him. Um, so my, my history and my culture, when I found mum, I finally found my country. I grew up not black enough to play with the black kids and not white enough to play with the white kids, so I copped it from both sides of the fence. And my only insight into becoming or Aboriginality was the media. And back in those days, there was never anything positive about us in the media. All I ever saw was the petrol sniffing, the violence, the crime. They had drugs and alcohol. And at a young age, I thought, oh, well, that's what I've got to be. You've got to be Aboriginal because what I'm saying is telling me that's what Aboriginal people are like. So I did. At the age of 15, I found a lovely place called King's Cross. At the age of 15, I used to love that place back in the day. So I ended up on the streets. Lived all around Sydney, the cross, was up there all the time, back in those days. Took on the drugs, the alcohol, the petrol sniffing. Took all that on as well. And that was uh, now later in life realising trauma is not a new thing for my people. It's not a new thing. It's not a white thing. What is new is our coping mechanisms and our tools that have been taken away from us to deal with the trauma. And it's, it starts off by the napping of stone, making a spearhead. It's not a matter of just grabbing a rock and tapping it to make a spearhead. You've got to search for the right stone. You've got to find the hammer stones. You could spend all day walking around a quarry to find the right stones to use. It's listening to the songs of the stone. When they sing, when you tap them, listening for the stone. All that, doing it with other men. This is how we dealt with our traumas. The women would weave knots. And depending on the, the trauma level would depend on the knot, the intricacy of the knot. So sitting around together with mob, with, with family, and working and talking. So we dealt with our traumas. But now the, the, the tools of the drug and alcohol, just to numb the brain. Just to numb the brain, band-aid. But the history I share with you is a very brief history of country and people because when you have a welcome to country I always ask people to have a little bit of thought of what we've been through to get to where we are today. I can tell you the whole history of every race in this country but how many can say that about us? We are the world's oldest living culture, continual living culture. We don't have stories of how we've travelled from another country to land here. We don't have those stories because that's never happened. We've been here since day one. We, our stories relate to Boami and his son, Dara Mulem, and they created, they're our creators. And I can show you the footprints on the top of these mountains where Dara Mulem walked from one mountain top to another mountain top. I can show you the, his footprints. I can show you his footprints when he reascended back into the sky. I can show you these footprints. So we've been here since day one. I always like to say we've been here for 250,000 years plus BC. And the BC stands for before Cook. So it's always an honour to perform a welcome to country. 
Welcome to country is not a ceremony we've just come up with in the last five years because we'd never have had a welcome to country ten years ago in Australia. We'd never have had one. And I know for a fact you'd never have had a welcome to country performed by such a good-looking black fellow as myself <laughs> at this time of the morning on a Monday. <laughs> Traditionally, we've been welcoming each other to the country again since the beginning of time. It's no different when you welcome people to your house. You need to show them where the toilet is. You need to show them where the food and the kitchen is. You need to show them what rooms they can and cannot visit. And we've been doing that on country, where the toilets are, what water holes they can and cannot drink out of, what sacred sites they can't visit. So it's always an honour for me to perform this ceremony back on country. And the land we're gathered on traditionally is Gadigal. Gadi is the name of the language group. Gaddy. Gal is people. When you do an acknowledgement of country, this question has come up quite a lot lately as well, acknowledgement of country, how do we do it? We're worried if we're going to say the right or wrong thing. I always say the first word that comes out of your mouth when you do an acknowledgement of country is I. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we gathered on here today no traditional owners left. So then what are you acknowledging? I find it a bit disrespectful when I turn up to so many meetings and it's the same generic acknowledgement of country. As I said, I is the first word. Learn about the history of country because it's part of country. There's no right or wrong acknowledging of country, but it's personal. It's personal. So if, it, if someone says anything to you about your personal acknowledgement, that's now a personal attack on yourself. It's not about your acknowledgement. I just thought I'd throw that in as well. Gadigal are one of 29 tribes that make up the Eora Nation. That word Eora, we've all heard of that word Eora. I can guarantee there's nobody here that knows what that means. Does anyone know what Eora means? The word Eora in Gadigal means man. And the reason for this is because of the first conversation that took place between a white fellow and one of Pummelwoy's wives down at Botanical Gardens. Like most of our history, she was asked, what do you call this place? She didn't understand English. She pointed and said Eora. Not far from where that conversation took place, we have the, the Conservatory of Music. That Conservatory of Music is built directly on top of sacred initiation site for men. So the boundaries for the Eora start at the ocean and they're surrounded by three of Australia's most beautiful rivers. We have the Hawkesbury River, the Nepean River and the Georges Rivers. In between those three mighty and beautiful rivers, there are 29 tribes that make up the Eora Nation. And the name of the tribe you gathered on here this morning is Gadigal. So always first and foremost, on behalf of those Gadigal ancestors, because their spirit is still in the lands and the waters. On behalf of Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, as the cultural authority on these lands, it gives me great honour to welcome you all here this morning. Welcome to Gadigal. I've also brought in my Yidiki, Odyssey House. As I mentioned earlier, I, I went through the trials and tribulations of dealing with trauma through drugs and alcohol. So I know Odyssey House very well. I know Odyssey House. And when I heard it was for Odyssey, I thought, oh, I'm going to bring a gift. I brought, you can't have it. <laughs> but I'm going to gift a song. It's called Yidiki, not called Didgeridoo. Didgeridoo is a white man's word. Good Yidiki. Yidiki only comes from the top parts of Australia. Yidiki is not a traditional instrument in New South Wales. It's a borrowed instrument. The word Yidiki means voice. So when we play Yidiki, there are songs that we play on the Yidiki. Every living thing on country has a song. And what we're seeing now is once these our animals, plants and waters lose the song and the stories, they become an object. And unfortunately, the only way we can save these objects is by putting a monetary value to it. The focus is no longer on the water and the animals. The focus is now on the money. 
So I'm just going to finish off by playing a welcome song on the Yiddiki. I'd love to stay and have a yarn, but for me the traumas are ongoing. I have to go and pay a white bloke by the name of Wilson for parking on my own land. <laughs> and, he, and he's not cheap either, <laughs> fella. He's not, is he? Every, if you've ever seen that movie, every time I put the ticket in the machine and the fee comes up, I sit in the car and I go, Wilson! I was hosting an event with the Sydney Symphony Orchestra and five minutes before I was about to walk out, one of the big bosses came running downstairs. She said, Uncle, we love you. Welcome to countries. But tonight, can you not do the Wilson joke? I first looked at her, I said, that's not a joke. I then asked her why. She said, because he's sitting in the audience tonight. <laughs> and we're trying to get a bit of money out of him, a bit of funding. And I said, well, I'll go out there and just tell him to give you some of the money I've given him over the last five years. And then I said, you, how can you do that to me? You've just given me content. You've given me the golden unicorn. How can I not go out and say anything? As I'm walking out to the microphone, the devil popped on this shoulder and the angel popped on this shoulder. And the devil's saying to me, go on, bro, go on, bro. you've got to give it to him. <laughs> Go on, you get out there and give it to him, brother. And the angel's going, Brendan, don't do it. Rise above it, Brendan. You're a much better person than that. And I didn't end up saying it. And I've been kicking myself ever since for not saying it. So thank you for having me. I'd, I'd like to thank you for having me. Welcome to Gadigal. By having me here, you've become a part of the rejuvenation of our tradition and culture back on country. So thank you for that. And I'll just finish off by playing the welcome song on the Yiddiki. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me. I pay my respects to my elders, past, present and, and emerging, and I extend those respects to my non-Indigenous brothers and sisters as well. The only thing that makes us different is our language. It's the only thing that makes us different. Welcome to Gadigal country and thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Brendan. Can I just say, I can't pretend to really to share in much of what uh, you did just express about your people. I can say that many of us here in the room do feel the pain of Wilson. So thank you so much for sharing that. Ladies and gentlemen, one more time, Mr. Brendan Karen. <laughs> and Brendan, we also have some, uh, we have a gift bag for you for appearing here with us today, if you could please join us on stage again. Is, that, is this evidence? Yeah. So, um... <laughs> oh! <laughs> when, I spoke, <laughs> when I spoke to Tanya, can I share this quickly? Yeah. I get asked quite a lot. I do a lot of events and sometimes um, events managers um, get very anxious about putting on an event. 
and they're worried about the big CEO coming from Japan or wherever. And so sometimes they ask questions and don't think about what they're asking. And one of the questions I always get is one, oh, do you need a change room? And I ask them, what for? I know why they're asking, do I need a change room? I say, what for? Oh, don't you want to get ready? And, and then I turn around and say, no, uncle in a red nappy is not a good look anymore. <laughs> And it doesn't matter what I wear, I'm still a black fella. <laughs> oh, is there anything else? I say, yes. Can I have a bowl of blue M&Ms on arrival? And I'd like the temperature of the green room to be 22 degrees. <laughs> and you would be surprised at how many times I can hear them actually writing that down. <laughs> and so inside my, <laughs> inside my bag... <laughs> and don't forget the green room. <laughs> oh, it is too. It's got the temperature on there, 22 degrees. I got a bag of M&Ms not so long ago. They left one in the green room. It wasn't a blue M and that, so what, you know what I did? I just ate all the blue ones and left the rest there in the bar. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. <laughs>